Keegan and Company. It's Keegan and Company, the company you keep. That's it. That's got to be it. Um, can I just state for the record that one time Keegan cancelled on me for a better option? No, that's so <laughs> shit. I'm kidding. That's so shit, but it is true. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it a lot. You can say who it was. I'm not going to say who it was. I'm not going to say who it was. Um, but I couldn't miss the op. And... I understand. But you get it better than anyone. That's Aww. why that's why you were that's why you're okay with it. Yeah, I was okay with it. Um what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do a quick piece to camera. Okay. I'll bring you some. I'm gonna stare at you the whole time. Yeah, I knew you were going <laughs> to. It's so funny. Every time someone comes into this and um <laughs> And they're a good friend. They just take you the piss so out of me the whole quick. time. Yeah. And it's like, I think it's just back to the old footy days. Um, I'll do a quick piece of camera. I'll bring you in and we'll, we'll settle into it. Let's go. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Keegan and Company podcast. For those who are new to the show, my name is Keegan Hipgrave. And if you haven't already, could I get you to jump over, give us a little like and subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. It's a great way for us to grow the audience, enhance the production and have some really great guests like I have today <laughs> in this episode, <laughs> she's already laughing. In this episode, I'm joined by one of the greats, uh, former professional netballer, <laughs> uh, and I say that very loosely, uh, former professional netballer, Kelsey Brown. Kelsey, how are you? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> so happy to be here. I'm, um, I'm so excited for this conversation, hey. Um, same. I did preface off camera that I'm going to be cautious, I'm going to have to be cautious of how loose I am with this discussion because we are good friends. Yeah. We've been friends for a little while. And I'm very – and that's like – that's my favourite thing about these conversations and everyone that's jumped on. To be honest, most of them are mates, to be honest. And I reckon our relationship over the last, what, couple <sighs> years? I would, No, I think I've known you for 14 months. Fire. Can you believe that? No way, No, though. we have. I literally met you, I think, September last year. Because I regard you, and for those who are listening, we're actually sitting in my auntie's place in Melbourne. <laughs> like we're sitting in my auntie's place in Melbourne. We've got we've got a cup of tea in front of us. We're sitting on some leather back chairs um, just to paint a picture for everyone who's <laughs> listening. There's some old school, beautiful furniture around. You've uh, missed the best part, the produce garden out the back. Oh, it's a beautiful, I love her garden so much. <laughs> I want to like, I want to live here. Like yeah. that's part of the reason. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, we've known each other for 14 months and I regard you as like, one of my really good friends. Same. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Is that not wild? <laughs> I think that often, but I don't know. From the minute we met, I think we clicked. We've got similar philosophies on things. So yeah. I feel like we have a lot of deep chats. <laughs> yeah, but they're the best. Like when you, when you can have like deep, meaningful chats with crew, I feel like that's when you know you're on the same wave. Like, we are, hey, we are. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, no, we, we linked up. Yeah, we linked up a couple, like what, 14 months ago. We had a coffee and then as soon as we had that coffee, I was like, Fuck, I love where this girl's head like so, And I've got to be careful like where my like mouth goes because I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to stop swearing on the podcast. My auntie who, whose house this is, she's like, you've got to stop swearing on the podcast. And I was like, I know, I'm so conscious of it. So It's okay. So, do you know um, someone the other day was talking about me and they were like, oh, like the only con. Apparently they were talking to a friend of mine and they yeah. were saying like, oh, the only con about her is she swears so much. And I was like, if that's my only con, I'll take it. Red but flag. I'm, yeah. <laughs> Red flag. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the same, so I'll try not to swear too much today. Beautiful. Okay. Um, how's your day? How are you feeling? My day was good. Lots of meetings. My life looks a little bit different now that I'm not running around a netball court. Obviously, there's a fair bit going on with netball at the moment. Um, probably a good time. If anyone's listening to this, maybe Google netball pay dispute. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's pretty poignant at the moment. Um, and yeah, but my days look very different now. Yeah. Sort of a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, but I did sit in two hours of traffic traffic to yeah, get here and i'm very grateful to have you here Kels. Okay. i'm very i'm very <laughs> grateful we we're, we're gonna do we're gonna do a good little training session at a gym in richmond um but we ran out of time we did because i was late to uh meet you but we did we did go for a nice little walk around the richmond oval yeah you forced me to take my shoes off so we could do a grounding session <laughs> that's fine i like honestly didn't even push back at all you were like are you not gonna ground with me uh, oh yep for I'm, sure i'm not gonna, taking my shoes i'm off. not gonna go earthing by myself that's just weird <laughs> <laughs> not like walking around bare so that's what we've done no yeah. i feel good but that's what i mean i was just like i wonder if you're gonna be stressed like coming out of the traffic i was like what's like the best thing we can do like, let's just go for like a nice little walk around a dog park we'll see some beautiful little pups we'll get the shoes off and we'll just go for a nice little walk and i feel great i don't know about I you feel but i feel great. great you've given me a grounding session and a chamomile tea to walk into this podcast so i don't I think I'm better prepared. <laughs> settle in, settle in. Um, 
welcome to retirement, Cassie <laughs> Brown. How you? That's um, that's what like obviously what a whirlwind. Like the last twelve months, it, yeah. just just being in netball, regardless. How how are you feeling? What are the emotions? Talk to me. I feel like um, that sentiment of like a lot can happen in twelve months. I have lived that so hard in the last 12 months I um, was looking back on where I sort of was this time last year and um, like this time last year I was playing fast five for um, the Australian like netball yep. team um, we like won the fast five title um, I was a Collingwood netballer I was living in Richmond with my sister who um, didn't have a partner mm. um, and like a family member of mine was really well. And so then I looked 12 months later, Collingwood, the f- netball team has folded. Mm. Um, I'm no longer playing netball, therefore I'm not, you know, playing fast five or anything mm. like that. Um, I live in Geelong and my sister is pregnant with a partner. So like my life oh. has honestly just changed um, dramatically. I'm doing commentary for the NBL now, which is a really exciting thing. And if you had have asked me that 12 months ago, yeah. there's no way that I would say, yeah, that's what I'll be doing. Yeah. Um, so life is just a whirlwind, but I feel like it's been a nice 12 months to embrace that change happens and Mm. sometimes you have no control over it. And, um, it's that, yeah, you got to make, uh, lemonade out of lemons. Mm. And so I feel like I'm fully embracing this new chapter of my life and yeah, it feels good. And I look at you, like I, we've obviously spoken throughout this whole process, the whole issues with Netball Australia, even like going through, just everything with like where netball's at and we have great conversations, but you're always glass half full. <laughs> like, but that's what I mean. Like every, even when like, like players aren't getting paid, players like at the moment, players haven't been played, um, paid, sorry, for the last eight weeks. Um, over the weekend, uh, Netball Australia sent a legal letter out to the players, sent to yep. the Diamonds girls <laughs> to say, you have to come to the presentation night. So we heard a voice about that. But throughout this whole and it might change when this podcast airs, but at the moment, this is where we're at. You're always glass half full. Oh, thanks. Where, kids. where does that come from? Is that, have you always been like that? Or is that something that's kind of you're taking on lately recently? No, that's a great quote. I feel like, um, I come from two parents. One is the most energetic, um, positive poly, like there is nothing her and my mum, her philosophy in life is, this is, sounds morbid, but it's like, she's trying to be positive is like the worst thing in life is death and anything else we can get through together. So it's like, I love it. So I feel like that's where I get everything from. Like nothing is that bad Mm. and everything we can work through. Um, and then my dad on the other hand is like quite a cynical, Man, so I feel like <laughs> out of out of that, I've taken on my mum's sort of. We can get anything done. You can mm. be whatever you want to be, whatever you want to do. Go hard at it. Um, nothing is out of your reach. And also, Dad and I have Barney's like no other because I'm often questioning his outlook on. Um, you know, why do we have to be so negative about it? So I feel like it, it's come from both of them. Yeah. Um, and I just think. Yeah, that there's never been anything in my either career or life that has ever sort of gone exactly to plan or has been handed to me or um, I think my career has been, for want of a better term, like a shit fight Mm. Um, and it's been a lot of sort of proving yourself and, and that's what elite sport is like a lot of the time. But I feel like, yeah, everything that I've ever sort of achieved has come out of like having to really like grit my teeth and do it. Mm. And so I think, yeah, if you look at any situation um, positively, I think you're going to find that as the outcome, like Mm. whether it's what you envisioned from the start or whether you find a completely different positive or a silver lining. Mm. Um, And probably recently I spoke about this on another podcast, like I got it tattooed on my ankles Mm. um it's this saying as within so without and for me it's just like yeah if you look at something negatively you're going to find it Mm. like how you look at a situation your perception on a lot of things is just exactly how um i think you're it's going to turn out do you think about sliding door moments oh absolutely you know the the concept sliding doors where like you could take like one small action can just change the whole trajectory of your life exactly like which is so wild like i had um one of my really good friends um he was playing for the the new zealand warriors when COVID hit the warriors had to make a decision on where they wanted to base 
the team. Mm-hmm. It could be Gold Coast, Brisbane, Sunny Coast, Terrigal, Central Coast. And he ended up moving to um, – they, they got based in the Central Coast in yep. New South Wales. Um, from that he was in a relationship. Uh, the relationship obviously ended. Okay. He, he, he <laughs> I met, was like, oh, my God, I'm so happy. <laughs> <being."> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> met, met, met a new girl in Terrigal. Um, they fell in love. They were together for however long. They just had a baby and it was all based on this one person mm-hmm. making a decision to go to Terrigal. Imagine if they went to Brisbane or Gold Coast. It's like that whole chapter of his life would have been changed. I couldn't um, believe in that stuff more purely because I feel like I've lived it the last five months. Mm-hmm. Like Collingwood folding and the way I sort of looked at that at the time I was like oh my god what am I going to do and I was hoping to play like another couple of years at Collingwood and that was just going to be sort of like the end of my career and and that would be it but Collingwood folding has essentially been the best thing that's ever happened purely because I wouldn't be working at the NBL I wouldn't have had the time to be able to do that I'm like my new role in commentary has been something that has like lit a fire inside of me that I'm like, I love, I'm so passionate about it. I'll do so much study and work around it and I'm running towards it. But that wouldn't have happened if Collingwood hadn't have folded. So like, thank you, Craig Kelly, almost, because it's given me a new lease on life, a new passion to explore. Doesn't mean I feel any differently about netball or my love for the sport or my career. Mm. It just, yeah, it is that sliding door moment that something's happened But so many great things have come from it. And I love that you just fully lean into it. (laughs) Like imagine, imagine how many girls were just like kickstones, like boys as well. Every, like anyone is like, this is unfair, poor me, victim mentality. But you're just like, nah, this is actually an opportunity for me to maybe get a leap or get a head start on my media career or do things that I actually enjoy. Like I saw you doing some really cool stuff with like the speak share boys. Um, You're doing cool stuff and you're doing what you love you're, yeah. not, you're not doing anything that it's like oh maybe this could be like i need to pay rent obviously i need to do this i need to do that but you're doing like what you love which mm. is so inspiring yeah i think uh not often are you presented with you know a heap of opportunities and i i often preface this with like i know i'm so fortunate to have like a platform that i have mm. and um I've been granted that through netball so i'm so grateful mm. f- for netball for that but i think my biggest thing is like I never want to look back on something and be like oh I I said no to that opportunity out of fear of judgment of what people are going to say like Mm. I'm sure there's a thousand people out there that are like what the hell is she doing and Mm. like why is she doing this and um but I don't ever want to look back and be like oh I said no to an opportunity because I was fearful of judgment Mm. or you know I just want to if is this going to make me happy even if it's for the interim even if it's for Mm. the short term which um, sometimes with careers in broadcast and everything like that, it's a it's a really tough game to break into. Mm. It can be a really short lived career, so you just got to enjoy it while you can. Same mm. with sport. Sport isn't it? You can't be a professional netballer when you're sixty. Yeah. So you just got to enjoy it while you can. Was there any times in your <clears throat> career, or you've got some water there as well? Um, if you've like, is there any times in your career where you had said no to something where you're like, oh, you know what? I wish I did that. <laughs> Um, probably just more wasn't clear around my boundaries. And we've had discussions about this, you know, in the last week, just around decisions. Mm. And, um, I just really in, in relationships, in friendships, in career, I just really wasn't sure and assertive about like my boundaries Mm. and what will make me happy. And I feel like through my twenties, I became sort of like this wishy washy, yes man and um I wasn't really sure on my morals or what I felt Mm. um so yeah I I feel like that has been the thing that has changed the most just Mm. being really clear on my boundaries and therefore like being able to say no to the things that I know aren't going to make me happy or give me energy or serve me I probably haven't said no to things in the past I think my issue has been saying yes to everything and it not aligning with my values yeah Um, so I would say probably the opposite. That's so beautiful though, because there's so many, and I'd like to get your thoughts on when you first came into professional sport, because I have this conversation all the time (laughs) with athletes who are in, who are probably 17, 18, 19 years old, early twenties who are coming into professional sport and they want to fit the mold of whatever team they're in. And if it's a successful team, amazing. And you're probably going to go really far and it's going to be great. But there's other times where you might not be in such a successful team where 
the community or the culture might be a little bit toxic mm-hmm. and you just fit into what everyone else is doing because they're the people who you probably looked up to when you were a kid. Yeah. Was there any times that you went through like that? Yeah, well, I think that's the petrifying thing about coming into a sport is that I look back on it now, I'm like, wow, that some of the things that I would have done to make it back then are just things that wouldn't even cross my mind now. And um, But you you have to do that. It's your dream. It's your passion. Like my biggest love was or my biggest dream was I want to represent my country and I want to have a really great netball career and I want people to like weirdly I look back on this like I want people to know my name. Now I'm like, yeah. oh, I would love to yeah. be. Fly under not the that radar. I'm like, <laughs> not that I'm, guys, I'm like a f grade celebrity like it's like no I'm like a y like I'm not even anyone um but I you know no one knows my name externally from netball but sometimes yeah I feel like I lived the early stages of my career just wanting to prove to everyone regardless of whether it aligned with how I felt or what my values were Mm -hmm. I just wanted to prove that I belonged and that I was there and I, I think that is a really big challenge when you're coming into team environments the most Um, grateful thing I am for netball is that it has allowed me to experience that and then rectify that later in my career and be like okay well I'm 31 now like there is no way that I would say yes to anything if it didn't align with what I felt. When did that start turning around? Was that the last couple of years do you think? Uh, Yeah I reckon (laughs) I always say this to people is I don't really think I started to know myself or know uh, what I believed in until I was about 28. Really? Yeah. And that was like, that's pretty late. Like I think people would look at that and be like, wait, what? You spent your whole 20s like not really sure? Mm. No, I had no idea. It was only when um, sort of things came up in um, friendships or career or relationships that I was sort of like, oh, okay, I do really strongly believe in this. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so I think it's like the last couple of years and I've just sort of honed in on when I feel something yeah. – how does, like, what does this mean? Um, and now I'm really strong and sure on, you know, what makes me happy. And and I feel like much more even keeled in my mental health because I'm sure of myself. The reason I ask that question is because I see, I would imagine there's a lot of young boys and girls who are coming into professional sport and just want to fit the mold. And I don't know the answer. No. I don't have, <laughs> I don't have the answer for you all. I don't know if that's... Um, if it's a good thing just to fit in or if it's a good thing to stand out, I imagine a lot of people would stand out, might not get the start that they wanted to or if they fit the mould then they'll get the start. I don't know the answer. I think my thing to like young kids is that you might not be able to change that. You might actually have to um, conform and fit into all of that. But I would start to take mental and individual notes of how things are making you feel. And that doesn't mean you have to act on them or speak about them or change, you know, whether you do fit the mold or whatever. But I would start like a little notes on like, okay, this incident happened and it didn't make me feel good. I can't do anything about it now. But when I revisit it and I get a little bit more confidence within this environment, maybe I can address it. Mm. That would be my thing. (laughs) (laughs) But I love and I like I would would have loved to have someone like you Um, as like an older like a role model in the team because what you're doing and what you've been doing the last couple years like yeah you're you're pretty sure of yourself you know what you like you know what you don't like you're you're very comfortable to speak your opinion as well but you're allowing other people to be themselves as well you allow them to be a netballer but you also allow them to do other things that they like like they might want to sing they might (laughs) want to do music they might want to you know sing a national anthem somewhere they might want to be in technology or go to uni or whatever, like whatever it is, but you're allowing them to not just be Kelsey Brown, the netballer or, you know, eat cert, whatever, whatever professional sport you are. You're not just that identity. You're actually another person as well. And you've got other things that make you who you are. Like I saw this, I think it was like, I don't want to quote Joe Rogan and Alex Hormozzi. I don't <laughs> want to, I no, don't want to do it. Ahead. But I think it was Alex Hormozzi was like, Joe Rogan is him and he's so great because he loves UFC. Mm-hmm. Um, he loves hunting and he loves all the things that he loves to do. And that makes him him. Mm-hmm. And you got someone like yourself who loves netball or who has been playing netball for the last 10 years mm. um what played over like 106 professional games which is just insane and i want to <laughs> and i want to touch on that a bit later on um but you love singing you yeah. love music you love business you love commentary and all that makes who you are well humans are multifaceted i'm sorry but like that's just i i 
didn't realize I felt so passionately about this yeah. until someone put, tried to put me in a box. And mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, hang on. Like I, and I started to identify with that. I was like, oh yeah, it, everyone externally has started to put me in this, like, you can only do that. And like, I think the best example and very relevant right now, Mon Conti, she just won the AFLW, um, what is it called? What's it called? Is it called the... It's called the like Best and Ferris. Well, it's called the Best and Ferris. I didn't know whether they named it after anyone yet. They haven't named it no. yet, but they're talking about um, it. Probably Erin Phillips maybe if it was going I, to. I think they were having that conversation of like who they were going to yeah, name. Yeah, anyway. I mean that's my that's my <laughs> two cents. I don't know anything. Um, but she's a great example of it. Like yeah. she is um, a um, championship winning um, WNBL player mm. and now she's gone and just absolutely trounced the AFL world, yeah. AFLW world. Um, and I feel exactly the same, but probably not as like dual athlete, but more as like, there are so many facets to people. Like there are so many dimensions to mm. people. There is, I feel like it's a really negative thing to just force people into being one thing. Mm. Like, um, and what made me, a uh, okay netballer was probably because I had outlets and things that I could do outside of that. Mm. I will say though, I have found since being removed from um, netball that it is sometimes hard to break the shackles of what you are. Um, So I've moved into the MBL world and not that I think there's a lot of commentary around this, but it's kind of like, wait, what's a netballer doing here? Mm. I can't be a netballer for my whole life. I've done a lot of media stuff. I can move into this space. But I think everyone just wants to be like, wait, you're a netballer. You'll only ever be a netballer in our eyes. Like how can you move into this space? Mm. Um, And to that I'm just – I just really want to be a role model of like you can be so many different things. You don't have to just sit in one lane um, even though everyone will try and tell you that you have to just Mm. sit somewhere. Mm. Um, and I will always try and push for that and for young girls and boys to make sure they're honing different skills Mm. because you never know what you're going to, I didn't know that if I was going to finish netball that then I could go into like, I can't cause I'm not good enough, but like a music career, you don't know, you don't know where life's going to take you. I didn't know that I was going to end up in the media sphere and absolutely love it Mm. and want to, um, pursue that as a career for the next 40 years. Mm. But you know, I, yeah, I, I just think, it, yeah, humans are multifaceted and it's silly to think that they're not. Mm, I love that. Sorry, Copes, th- that's recording, yeah? Yeah, it is. This is, <laughs> my, this is my OCD, this is not even OCD, but I was like, for the last, like, I don't know, I, I, I was like, I've, I've done it. I'm glad you stopped because, like, I didn't think that. Yeah, because I was thinking, I have this, I have this, like, not anxiety, but, like, this little bit of, Oh my god! This is not recording because yeah. I've not I've I've accidentally not recorded before, wow. and it actually ties into the podcast I did with Braden Maynard like couple a couple of days ago, and I can talk about it now because um, his episode would have aired by the time your episode airs, but I sat down with Bruzzy and the night before the podcast, he I called him and I was like, um, "Mate, I know that you had some struggles in 2017, 2018 that you've never spoken about publicly. Would you be open it?" having the conversation he's like look mate i'm not i'm not ready for that yeah i was like of course like respected respected that 100 percent." and then um actually i did a podcast with um oleg markov which was amazing went for like almost two hours oh, like, wow. yeah he was um, he opened up about things he'd never spoken about wow. before incredible he's in tears i'm in tears it was oh my god wild. yeah full wild and i had to cut it i had to stop it because brazzy was out the front it was 10 o'clock and he oh. and, so we, and so we we cut it anyway it was beautiful it was great and then Braden came in and we're mid podcast, and he was like, um, "He's like, I know. I said I wasn't comfortable talking about it, but like, I want to talk about what's been going on in the last like five, six years." And I'm like, "Oh my god! Like, this is this is wild! Like, this is..." And then he talked about um, him no, stri- it wasn't recording. Hey, wait, what? Are you gonna say that it wasn't recording? Because I'm no, 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 I'm no, like, sorry, no, no, I'm no, like no, anxious. No, I'll, I'll circle back. I'll okay. say, I'll circle, I was I'll, like, I'll, "Oh my god! Don't tell me he's opened up about shit and it wasn't recording." <laughs> no, imagine you're probably like, "What is this tangent kicking no, no, right no, now?" Fine. <laughs> um, I'm gonna keep all this in, by the way. Um, but he he's talking about how he's been dealing with OCD since 20, 2017. Yeah, wow. At to the point where he couldn't 
he really struggles going to sleep because he's like, have I, have I locked the back door? Yeah. And would, and would get up and would go check the back door all night. He would go into training. He would go into games like with no sleep and he struggled for years and it affected his mood, affected his sleep, affected relationships. And the, he, and he could tell him talking about it because he was shaking. Like he was almost on the verge of tears, like talking about it. And then, and then, and then afterwards he was just like, I was like, mate, how do you feel? He's like, I feel so great. Like, Aww. I feel amazing. He's like, thank Actually you. I love Brazzy. He's hey. a Brazzy. He's the f- best. He's honestly like one of the nicest people ever. He's like, I feel so great. He's like, thank you so much for like allowing me to talk about this. And I was like, oh, mate, I nice. was like, imagine how many people are out there struggling with OCD that that you wouldn't that you wouldn't even know about. And he talked about str- um, strategies about how what helped him about getting off his phone and meditating and talking to a psychologist and and all these amazing things. And he's like, I've only ever spoken to like a hand like the boys and like my psych. I haven't told anyone. Yeah. Um, anyway, why I said that is because I'm sitting here and I was looking <laughs> at the camera and I was like, oh my god. I was like, this is not recording and the camera is your angle, so it's everything of you. And I was like, I'd much rather have your angle than my <laughs> angle. <laughs> Um, do, like it's funny that you say that. Do you want to like resume now, or is this yeah? No, like, we'll carry we'll carry back on. Um, we'll carry back on. No, because what you've just said, then I <laughs> I don't know how we're going to segue into this if yeah. you don't want to care. But um, is so how I feel about mental health and like you know someone not wanting to talk about something mm. is because the stigma is obviously like real. But mm. I feel like a lot of the time we contribute to the stigma ourselves. And yes. like I had this conversation with you. Do you remember this? About the And I share? said about the speak share thing. I have it written down. Okay, in my we notes. can get to that no, later. No, 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 go, go. Let's let's lean in. Because I, re- I remember the exact point you're talking about because you did a beautiful um, campaign or what would you call it? You did a beautiful um, segment with the speak share boys. Mm. You did a collaboration. It was a with ca- campaign, yeah. Campaign, yeah, yeah beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And it was a beautiful campaign. And, <clears> and we had um, a, a great conversation because you sent me the script before – you went ahead. I felt very grateful, very yeah. privileged that you sent it to me. It was beautiful. And we're close friends. <laughs> close friend. Close I think friends. you were one of like, I think it was my parents, you, um, my sister. Yeah. I think that was about it. And and tell them what you told me because you were because you you said you were you're going back and forth forever. It was petrifying. And like I've been someone who's um spoken about you know mental health because I don't view mental health as like a weakness or anything like that. I feel like like I said before about humans and multifaceted, if you don't believe that, then like I'm not sure we're talking about the same mm. humans. Mm. Um, I feel the same about mental health. Like everyone has a brain. So everyone is going to deal with good mental – like mental health doesn't have to – I feel like mental health now has this stigma around like it has to mean negative mental health. But yes. mental health is – everyone has either good mental health, neutral mental health. Mm. Like these are just my opinions, by the way. I don't, yeah. I don't know, you know, all of this um book wise but you know it's not always negative mental health and I feel like yeah I I spoke to you in the car I think we were on the phone and I said I'm just so stressed about putting this out because I I I just don't know what the response is going to be in fact I do know what the response is going to be and it's going to be a lot of people sending me messages which is so kind and thoughtful at the time but I feel like it's it never makes the person feel good. And I get all of these messages. It's like, you're so brave. And you're. why is it brave to talk about something that everyone deals with? I don't understand that. And I I really do struggle to get out of myself and, and understand that not everyone views mental health the same way that I mm. do. I just think that mental health is something that everyone deals with. Um, and I said, you know, I'm there's going to be so many people that are like, oh, you're so brave and you're so this. And it's going to feel nice, but it's also going to make me feel like shit yeah. because I'm going to wonder if everyone now thinks that I'm weak and pathetic and, you know, that stigma remains. And then I said, but in not putting this out, I feel like I contribute to the stigma myself because I'm sitting here being like, it's shameful to put it out. It's it's such a paradox, I think, to sit here and be like, I'm so worried about what everyone's going to think if I put this script out, but also withhold that information because you're contributing to the stigma. The thing that you, that thing that stood out to me where you're like, you're like, I'm the stigma. I am. <laughs> you're I like- was like, I'm everything that I'm talking about. Yes. I'm like, I'm here. I want to like talk about it. I want to break the stigma yet. I'm having a phone call with you being like, mm. I'm petrified, yeah. which is fair enough, but it was just the whole reason as to why I would do it. Still felt petrified, still yeah. spoke to you the day that it went out. Actually, yeah. I want to um, 
give a shout out to you because you messaged me after it went up and you were like, how, like, how are you? Are you feeling okay? Like how are you, you know, just to check in. Well, it's a lot, it's a, a lot, it's a lot to put out, right? Um, and I was like, no, I feel really good. And then sort of as it went on, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel really stressed. I wanted to take it down. I felt overwhelmed with everything. Um, just because you do, you open up for people to have their opinion on it and that's absolutely fine. Mm. But I think when you're so sound in your opinion of what mental health is for um, humans, mm. I really struggle to understand how anyone could be like, oh, it's pathetic to have mental health issues. Yeah. Um, every single person that you love and that you uh, spend days with is going to have mental health mm. stuff come up. Yeah. And people, that, people like people die, like people have to deal with mental health around, you know, cl- people's deaths close to them. Yeah. Um, people get sick. You don't get a job opportunity. Like all of that has, um, ish, uh, has impacts on your health, mm. mental health, mm. but people just don't, people just look at mental health as like, you must be depressed lying in bed and you can't get out. That's, that's the biggest <clears throat> thing. And I, and I, you articulated that so well <laughs> because like, yeah, we're not like, the deepest, darkest thing people, I think you said it perfectly, like the deepest, darkest thing people would think that's mental health. It's like, nah, mental health is a whole spectrum. It, it might not be, it might not be getting the job. It might be feeling stressed out with the kids. It might be overwhelmed. You might have a, a very heavy mental load at the moment. And that's why I think these conversations are so great because we're actually normalizing having these conversations instead of bottling it all up and, and getting to the point where you're going to explode. And I love the analogy of um, it's like a Coke bottle and every, you know, every stress, every little stress is kind of like you shaking the Coke bottle, oh. but having the conversation is like slowly <gasps> twisting the lid and it's like kind of releasing Release. it. It's releasing it. Toddy Lubinsk has told me that. Toddy Did was, he? Toddy was just here before. Love yeah. that man. One of the absolute, shout out Todd. <laughs> shout out Toddy. One of the absolute greatest men in the world. But he was, um, he, and that's why he talks about like meditation and, and talking to a psychologist and, 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 you know, I'm, I'm big on talking to psychologists as well, even like friends and, and your support network because, yeah, like it is a, a brave much people think it people think that it's a brave macho thing to have it all bottled up and, and I'm a strong person. But it's like, nah, like vulnerability is a full strength. Like vulnerability is the hardest how can I just not say that word? Is the hardest thing to do. Mm. And I still, as much as everyone thinks that I'm an open book, I still sit here sometimes and say things that I'm like I feel uncomfortable. Mm. I don't want to do this. It's actually so much easier to not let anyone in. Like, and that's where, um, you know, I often sit with people and I think the easy option is to just keep everyone at arm's length and not let them see you. Yeah. Uh, because the minute you open up and you're vulnerable to people, like there's risk of, you know, potentially them using it against you mm. or um, potentially feeling ostracized or isolated but I think what you'll find and so many times like if I'm not speaking about the stuff that I've been through and mine I think this is another thing that people get caught on you don't have to have lost a friend to suicide you don't it doesn't have to be the world has ended and you know it doesn't have to be the most catastrophic Mm. life event that happens to rock your mental health it Mm. can just be something that is really important to you that doesn't go your way but I think all of it matters and all of it can um, accumulate. Mm. And my story isn't, if, you know, when I put that speak and share thing out, a lot of the things that I deal with, uh, I had dealt with in the past, aren't, you know, your, your really deep, dark things. Like, yeah, yeah it's full on, it's eating disorders, mm. it's, but I'm sure there's thousands of people out there going through the same thing. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where people get caught on like, oh, my mental health is fine because I haven't been through anything Mm. like, um, dramatic or really drastically life changing. Mm. That's not what mental health is. Like you said, I think the best way to explain it is a spectrum. Yeah, I do. I do want to touch on your stuff. Um, but just beforehand, do you find that when you talk about it and you own it, then it takes the sting out of anything that anyone else can say? hundred percent. Like if you like, if you like, I see you putting, if you put something out and it's like, this is what I'm struggling with. Then it's like, no one can sort of come at you with that. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I think it's like, I own it. And this is, this is the reality of it. Yeah. I think it's also shows people. Cause I think especially with social media and this day and age, everyone can just see 
hate when people say it's a highlight reel, but you know, everyone can see the best version of everyone. Mm. Uh, but I think, yeah, being able to sort of like talk about it and say like, I'm so flawed. I think that was the biggest thing that I said in the speak and share. Mm. That was probably my favorite line was like, I have so many flaws, mm. um, as does everyone, but we're so um, conditioned not to own them because we're so caught up in like trying to prove to everyone that we've got these perfect lives and mm. whatever. I'm not perfect at all. I've never had a perfect life. I don't do things perfectly. I still make, I'm, I'm, I'm 31, still make mistakes all the time. Yeah. But I think if you can say, yeah, I make mistakes all the time and I'll try and be better, mm. then yeah, it does. It takes a sting out of anyone being like, yeah, she's not self-aware or she's this or she's that. How did the collab come about? Because you did a collab um, with the hoodie and the hoodie's sick. It's actually si <laughs> it's actually sitting over on that chair. You know, I thought you might have worn I it, was but you've going got a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wear it. We'll I thought you might have worn it. We'll get a photo of it after. Do you bring okay. yours? Do you bring your hoodie? Um, yeah, I do. I did you actually? Car. We'll get a photo of it. I after. always keep it in the car just in case. Yeah. Um, How did it come about? So I reached out to them and I said, love what you're doing. They did um, – they put out a hoodie and I was like, just love what you're doing. Would love to be like a volunteer or like if you're looking for anyone to go into schools or anything mm -hmm. like that, I would just love to be a part of it. This was when I was playing netball and I sort of was like, um, I just want some one more thing to do mm -hmm. outside of netball that I can go away and it can give perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how we met. It was I started doing what ability. Yes. Um, so between like what ability and the speak share stuff, I thought that touched on um, just some stuff outside of netball that I could do to give back. Yep. Um, so I reached out and I was like, you know, can we link up? I would just, and we tried to link up for a coffee and it just never eventuated. They are down in Mornington and it was, it was all um, a bit too hard, but they were, um, you know, we sort of kept up the conversation thread and then they reached out and they were like, you know, we want to dedicate a hoodie to you. And I was, I was honestly mind blown. I was like, mm. what? Yeah. They originally wanted to do it with sort of three people. And on the hoodie, there's three sunflowers and they had the idea to have sort of three stories of people. And then we caught up for a coffee. And I think I obviously just have so much to say mm. <laughs> um, or, you know, um, such a story around and I was quite willing to talk about everything that had happened that I think they ended up just being like I don't think we're gonna have time for everybody else so <laughs> we'll just do you yeah <laughs> no um so yeah then they came back and they were like you know um we want to tell a female story um and it works that you're an athlete because there's so many kids that play sport and look um, up to you so yeah that's how it sort of came about and um, I think it just all the stars aligned because I had loved what they were doing and then I think the more that they'd sort of researched that I was also pretty open to talk about my past, yeah. um, they were sort of like this works. Did they did they know your past before? Um, before no, you? but I'd done a few articles years ago. Um, one unknowingly, like I remember doing an article with a woman and I had gone into it and I think the theme of the article was supposed to be like my journey so far. Mm. And I think because I'd like openly touched on the fact that I missed a nationals one year because um, I was not in a good way, mm. um, that sort of sparked her interest um, and the whole article became sort of about my mental health, which mm. essentially was a, like an outing without me wanting to do it. Yeah. Um, but I'm kind of happy it happened that way because it kind of ripped the Band-Aid off and then mm. sort of opened me up to – well, now I can talk about it because, yeah. you know, I don't need to be the person that's like, oh, I want to do an article about mental health. Yeah. It just sort of happened because I'd so um, candidly spoken about mm. it in an interview. Yeah, beautiful. And, like, shout out to the Speak Share boys just quietly. Oh, we love them. Those boys, like, <laughs> I, I'm the same as you. I've been trying to catch up with them every time I come to Melbourne and just, you know, conversation thread. And they're just the best crew and I love what they're doing, like, with their workshops. They're doing, like, a lot of run clubs now. So shout out to you boys. Like, for there is there will never be, like, too many mental health advocates in the world. I, there will never be enough. I went and did a um, program with them at mm. the school. I just went along. They invited me along and I did it while we were sort of doing the hoodie campaign. Yeah. And changed my life. Really? Like, I went down there and I was like, I've had the best day. I was so I was exposed to kids who were willing to talk about mental health and willing to reflect on things that at 
their age, I was not capable of doing. Yeah. I was like, young people are amazing. Yeah. It was unbelievable. But I think the one thing that stood out to me with the Speak and Share Boys, mm. um, and it's it's similar to a story that I've told about you, is when I put it out, there was two people that messaged, well, there was two people that messaged me. You were one that was like checking in to see how you are because obviously you knew. And the other was um, one of the boys said it in the speak and share thread that we had. He was just like, just checking how you're going. And I was like, you are walking the walk right now. Like you've, you haven't sat there and been like, we care about mental health. You literally in a time that you know is going to be a difficult moment for me have absolutely walked the walk and messaged me and been like, just checking in. I know this is going to be huge, but you're helping so many people. And I've kept a a few of the messages that they sent to me throughout that period of time. And sometimes I go back and read them because I'm just like, they were the most rewarding messages to receive from people who obviously are going out in schools and doing this, but they genuinely believe in what they're doing and they live it. Good goosebumps. <laughs> that's so beautiful. But it's like they do it because they care. Yeah. Like but I you think- know that some people wouldn't, like some people would miss that moment, but they didn't miss any moment that mm. they knew that I was maybe going to feel quite vulnerable. They yeah. didn't miss a moment. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, well done, boys. And I, I kind of want to rewind and, and touch on the experience. Like you, you talked about you talked, <laughs> you talked about um, the eating disorder yeah. and you talked about you going through your own mental health struggles when did that start first start popping up for you? Was, was there a time that you're like, this is where I'm struggling? Yeah, it was at school. Um, I speak a lot about being a bit of an overachiever at school and um, just trying to make everyone happy and people pleasing and trying to fit into social circles, but then also being like an A-plus student and also wanting to be the best player on a netball team. And I think all of that just culminated into overdoing it. Mm. Um like I told us, I told this story to my friend the other day and I said, like when I was doing projects at school, an assignment that should take two hours would take me four days mm. because I would go back and I would reread it and I would rewrite it and by the end I'd written four essays for the one thing that I, like I was just a perfectionist. Yeah. Um, still elements of that in my life now. But um, so that's sort of where it started and um, I remember mum I started acting out like I just started getting like really angry at things for no reason and mum just sort of being like what's going on took me to the doctors they were like yeah it's her hormones really I was like classic like young teenage classic young girl (laughs) classic teenage girl yeah she's going through puberty like this is you know she's just a rebel child um so they put me on the pill when I wasn't like sexually active, which right. was wild yeah. um, to try and like regulate my hormones. And then I think after a period of time they were like, oh, no, this is not good. Um, there was, was a lot of sort of like I just wanted people to understand me but I also couldn't communicate. That's how I would talk about that whole period of time is that I was like screaming out for people to understand me but like I couldn't mm. tell them what to do understand about me Um, and I didn't have the words and I feel like that's why you know I I do a lot of like writing and journaling and um, I talk about a lot of things and I feel like that has birthed from the fact that I wasn't for such a long period of time actually able to converse Mm. and explain how I was feeling so I feel like that's come out tenfold in my later years because that's super important to me Um, the eating disorder was a really interesting one because I think it was birthed out of just feeling out of control and not having control over much else in my life that I was like, okay, that's the one thing that I can control. And Mm. I was in denial so much about it. Now I haven't like really spoken publicly about it and I hope that this isn't like a trigger to anyone that's listening. Mm. Um, But I I would like make myself sick like five times a day Mm. and then not like and then be like, no, I'm fine. Like. Mm. It, it just became such a habit that I – and I was in such denial about it. Right. Um, my parents could obviously see what was happening. I was still at home. I was still living at home and like um, there would be sort of like meals that I – yeah, I would just was behaving in patterns that were like quite consistent with an eating disorder. Mm. But whenever I was asked about it, I would be like, no, nah. like I'm not – no. It's not happening. But that's, that was the narrative that you were telling yourself. I just you like was so it. in denial. Yeah, and and I didn't realise I was in denial until um, 
I got caught and I, they were like, you like, what are you doing? Mm. And I, that was the moment that I was like, oh my gosh, I am like, what, I don't know. I, I couldn't, I couldn't actually identify with the fact that I had a problem. Yeah. Um, and that sort of like came and went in my life for a little bit of time. Um, and then I think the worst that it got was after I did my ACL and again, like your mind playing tricks on you. <laughs> as, as a, in your mid mid twenties. Yep. Yeah. So it came back. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'd sort of got, um, I'd sort of got over like the worst of it and, and I had, hadn't, um, sort of behaved in that way for about four years. Um, and then when I did my knee, I convinced myself and I laugh about it now and I'm not laughing about it. It's just, um, mm. I, it's like an unfortunate thing. It's just a way that I've sort of dealt with it. Yeah. But because I look back on that time and I go, I cannot believe I thought that I convinced myself that not eating would not send so much load through my knee and that I would never hurt my, like I wouldn't hurt myself again and it would help me get better. But I yeah. mean, I was contributing to the cycle of I was trying to do rehab for a knee. Yeah. And so I would go and do my rehab and I would do all my like quad strengthening exercises and I would do all of my rehab and then I would spend the day not eating. So I wasn't like refueling. I wasn't yeah. building any muscle. Yeah. Um, and this was sort of around the time that we went to the hub for COVID, COVID. Um, and I, the saddest part is that I was genuinely enjoying how I was looking. Like mm. I felt this, uh, like, yeah, I look great. And I, you know, I'm ripped because <laughs> I didn't have any, um, fat on my body. So like my muscles and stuff were just like, I, I wasn't healthy, but yeah, I yeah. looked ripped. Yeah. Um, and the weird thing that happens in that period of time is that it's celebrated. So people are like, oh my God, you look so fit. I couldn't have been less fit in yeah, my life. Yeah. I, my body wasn't primed to play elite sport at that period of time, but I was being celebrated for how fit I looked. And, um, it wasn't until I got home from the hub that I met up with the dietitian who didn't travel with us. Mm. And she was like, is everything okay? Really? And I was like, yeah, like, aren't you proud of me? Like my skinnies are tiny. Yeah. And she was like, no, I'm concerned. Like, and that was, um, if I get emotional, but it was the moment that I was like, whoa, I didn't realize that I, that people were sort of looking at me being like, what's going on? Cause all people were telling me was that I looked great. Mm. Um, and then when I started to really delve into it with her, I was like, yeah, I'm eating, like I'm not eating. Um, and I'm really worried about sending load through my knee. And like, if I start running again, well, um, you know, to get back to playing, like I need to be this and I need to prove to people that I'm like really fit. And it was unpacking this whole thing that like I just created in my head about mm. <laughs> not sending load through my knee. It just makes no sense. Yeah. But um, so that was like a period of time that um, the saddest part was that I didn't see it in myself before I was told like, no, I'm genuinely concerned about you and this isn't healthy. And um, the amount of weight that you've lost in such a short period of time is not healthy. What strategies did you put in place? Because you obviously you had the conversation with your dietitian and then especially when you were a lot younger as well, even more so when you are a lot younger, what what strategies did you put in place? Did you talk to a psych? Like what, like she, what, what were the conversations? Yeah, so I obviously worked with her a lot on um, – I think the biggest thing that was the turning point for me was like you're not going to get back to playing netball and you're not going to get back to being a fit and healthy person unless you start to fuel yourself. And that was a priority. And that was a priority for me. I mean that was the whole reason that I ducked into this anyway. It was mm. sort of like, oh, you know, I want to get back quickly and I want to um, do X, Y, Z. Mm. And so she worked with me on like gaining a much more healthy relationship with food and not looking at food as like a scary thing mm, yeah. and looking at food as a way to like propel me into being a great athlete because at that period of time all I wanted to do, when your sport's taken away from you through injury, all you want to do is get back. You really start to appreciate your sport. Yeah. Um, so she sort of worked with me through viewing food as a way to be a tool to get back onto court and I think with that – and the help of a psych, mm. it was sort of understanding that like I'm causing more damage to myself if I'm not, um, yeah, viewing it that way. Yeah. So it was just changing my mindset. And I know it's not that easy for some people. I've, I've had so many friends um, 
and people deal with eating disorders and mm. and continue to have struggles with it and and some who have found really great coping strategies and have um, bounced out of it quickly yeah. or whatever but I know that it is an ongoing thing and I think it's um, massive with females like body image issues are just it's it's heartbreaking to hear what girls are going through. like I get goosebumps talking about it and one of the biggest things that came out of my speak share thing was just mm. parents I had mums say my daughter is just comparing herself to people on Instagram all the time and you know she's starving herself and she's not she doesn't want to play sport anymore because she doesn't want to have muscles and mm. like we were just talking about it yep. off air with Julia Robinson yeah yeah Julia um shout out to you girl that was amazing um and so I just think it's this really big issue at the moment. Um, mm. So if I can talk about that and that like I sit here now, I have like a much healthier view on um, my body and what it can do for me and how it can be. It took, like it takes mm. you through life and um, and that you're not your body yeah. for so many different reasons. Like, you know, your body. And it's so easy to get caught up in that social media, Instagram trap. Hey, scro constantly scrolling, constantly comparing ourselves to everyone. Like we all do it. Yeah. We all do it. Not just the young girl or the young boy, like us is now twenties, thirties. We're like, still doing oh it. Oh my gosh. And you look at someone else. And I think the coolest thing now is that and you probably are the same, but I catch, I can catch myself doing yes. it and being like, why, <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you don't have that knowledge or that capability when you're younger. And you don't have the evidence to be able to provide to yourself that, you know what, yeah, I can catch myself and do it. Like the hardest thing that has happened to you is the hardest thing that's ever happened to you. Mm. Whether whether you're, you know, a 16-year-old kid who just got his car taken away mm -hmm. or if you had just lost one of your parents or a good friend to suicide. Like it's the hardest thing is the hardest thing. And it's so easy to get caught in those downward spirals. But what I've learned more in the last couple of years is that you can actually catch it. Like you, you can actually catch yourself doing it. And this is something that, this was a tool that I learned from my psych. Whereas like, yeah, I would go into not a spiral, but yeah, sometimes, like sometimes I would go deep down, I would, I would spiral and I wouldn't be able to catch myself because I didn't know you could. Mm. And then once you do it, and it's time, it's reps, it's, it's doing the reps. <laughs> yeah, reps. It honestly. Flexing the muscle. That's what I say the, all the time. You're yeah. flexing the muscle hundred percent. And then like when I start having a negative thought about anything, whether it's not being good enough, that's a big thing that I struggle with. Like, and I think a lot of people in sport probably have that as well. Um, that not being good enough where you can catch yourself and you're like, oh, actually, no, I've, I've done the evidence, like I've, I've done the work to get where I am and then you can catch yourself and then you start looking at the good side. And there's a million tools. Like there's another little tool um, where like you close your eyes and like you visualize um, that negative thought or that negative thing in like a cloud and you like picture the cloud like floating away. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I've never heard that one. No, no. I, Thank I, you, Keegan. No, it's all right. <laughs> but I use, that. I use that all the time. Like I'll, I'll take a deep breath, like <sighs> – I'll take a deep breath and then I'll like, I'll picture like this beautiful like blue sky and mm -hmm. there'll be like a cloud and it'll be like whatever bad thing or I'm thinking about and it I just, and it just drifts away and then I come back in. And I, when I first started doing that, it might be like four, five, six clouds. You know what I mean? Oh, it takes so much time to, to do that, but it, it just reps and it, and it helps. I think the thing I learned the most is I started to pay attention to my negative thoughts. And when I started to pay attention to them, I start, I think, the coolest thing that I realized was like, there's so many of them. Like, mm. let's just, sometimes it's exhausting to try and like flip them all. Yeah. But I think just being aware of like, oh, wow, this is running through my head yeah. all day, every day. No wonder sometimes I feel terrible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, I just think I feel for young kids and I know that's a narrative that's happening, happening a lot, but I just, I didn't grow up in the midst of, how social media operates at the mm, moment and yeah. um i struggle to navigate it at you know through my 20s yeah but i look at kids now and i'm like the comparisons and um i try not to add to that like mm. when i show up on social media i really try not to add to it sometimes i feel yeah, I feel responsible if I'm adding to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's like a conscious thought of mm. mine sometimes when I'm posting on social media. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to rewind, but I do want to touch on that time when you first went and saw the doc um, mm -hmm. about you were clinically depressed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I don't mean to put words in your mouth. I know that you've spoken about this openly. I know we've had conversations about your, you're comfortable talking about this. Yep. Um, you were clinically depressed and they put you on antidepressants. Mm-hmm. How was your experience with that? Were you on them for long and did you think they helped or did they not help? Um, going to preface this with saying like obviously everyone is so different so my experience is going to be different to uh, everyone else's. I love that you did that. Thank but you. But I think um, – so I wasn't on them for long um, and I went on them and was quite open to it because I was like I just don't want to feel how I'm feeling anymore. So um, it was kind of the whole – if this is going to make me feel better, of course, yeah. let's give it a crack. And we tried different doses. We tried different medication. I tried different psychs, talking talking to different psychs. And there was just a lot of things that like didn't stick. Um, and one thing that I've always felt like I'm pretty good at is that like if I get a gut feeling or if I don't feel like intuition is massive for me, mm. if I feel a little bit off, don't run with that. Yeah. Like get out of that. Um, so I would I would – often say you know like this one doesn't feel good I think my the worst experience I had with antidepressants was just it numbing me out like I didn't feel the lows but I also didn't feel elated about anything like Mm. nothing was exciting to me um winning a game of netball like just wasn't exciting something that you would enjoy very much yeah like I'm a competitive person I love you know and so I remember saying like, I just don't want to feel like I'm flatlining. I feel like I'm just coasting through life and like nothing's really exciting me. But I mean, the the great thing is like nothing's making me feel terrible either. But I was like, I just don't think I would rather utilize um, tools and strategies and mental cues and stuff instead Mm. of using medication. So can we try and like, I would rather catch myself in the the depths of it and use tools that you give me as a psych instead of flatlining. Like I think that was, so I chose, um, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and that doesn't work for everyone. Like sometimes people and you know, some people find medication that really works for them and allows them to live a really fulfilled life and feeling really positive and just not feeling the depths of it. But for me, um, I think it took a little bit away of uh, a little bit of my like instinct in my game away as okay. well. Like okay. a little bit of that, like I'm not tall or like that skillful or that like physically gifted. Very humble. But no, I'm not. But one thing I'm like tenacious and like I love winning and yeah. like I'll get after it. And like I just didn't really have the like uh, yeah when I was on antidepressants. So yeah, not long but. Um, I'd, I'd love to learn more about this because I like I don't know I I'm, I want to have these conversations to learn more I want to bring on psychologists and, and clinical psychs who prescribe these medications just so we can learn more about it but my initial thoughts is that someone who's in a position where they might be might be really struggling what what's everything else you said it perfectly what's everything else that we can do before we jump on them you know, is, 100%. Our, is our is our diet right? You know, are we staying off the piss? Are we staying away from drugs? Are we physically exercising, which is huge for our mental health? Do we have good community? Do we have good culture? Like there is so many, like there's, <laughs> there's so many things that we could try before going down that route. And I'm not knocking psychologists. I want to be a psychologist. Yeah. Like, I want like. Or medication, you know. Like, I'm not, like knocking, said, med- no, I'm not no. knocking medication at all. I think there's a hundred percent. For those people who are who are further down that path, but I think a probably great way to start is what's everything we can do? Can we can we bring a variety of like good quality foods, good quality meats? Like, can we start with training? Yeah. Can we start? Can we start? And it, and everyone's and I imagine there's probably some people's like, yeah, well, you guys are professional sportsmen. Like, you get to told what to do, you can do it. It's like you just got to start. No, I th- I fully believe in that checklist. Like. I look at myself now and I look back then Mm. and I'm like, okay, I had pretty much been like I'm burnt out from school and my um, like training and like um, that period of time, you know, everything was overwhelming. Do you think I said no to anything? Yeah. Like do you think I changed my schedule at all? No. I just was like how do I feel better? Um, So I look at that now and I'm like there's so many other things that I could have done like – Obviously I was exercising with sport, but like was I – all of the exercise that I was doing was for my sport, for nothing else, not for like enjoyment. I wasn't going for a walk every morning just because I felt like doing it. I wasn't going for a run because that's what I desired doing. Everything Mm. that I was doing was for something else 
Um, and so I look back on that time now and I'm like, if I wish, I wish I used the checklist, like, mm. um, it's not something like I have on my wall, but it's mm. like, you know, have I caught up with friends? Yeah. Have I spoken to my mom? Have I eaten well this week? Have I slept well? And like majority of the time, if I'm feeling terrible, there's like one thing in that or mm. two things or three things that I've neglected yeah. that I will try and rectify first. And then if I'm still having an issue, I'm like, all right, now let's go to what's the next tool. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love everything you just said there. I <laughs> had a coach one day who said, when your world gets really complicated and really stressed, you think of it as this huge, you know, you know big thing, but bring your circle small, like, like come in and like think and like simplify everything. Like sleep is one of the biggest contributors to mental health. Like it is insane. And I understand that there are some people who really struggle with sleeping, but you look at like, what are the best things that is going to help me to sleep? Yeah. Get off my phone an hour beforehand or yeah. half an hour beforehand. Is the temperature right in the room? You know, is it dark? Is there no sound? And I know everyone's different, but Matthew Walker, he's, he's been studying sleep for the last 20, 30 years and he's got an incredible book called Why We Sleep. And I originally read it to give me another level of performance when I was playing in the NRL. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll use it now as a way of like de-stressing and, men and mental health when I'm feeling overloaded. I'm like, I am prioritizing sleep. In life, yes. 100%. And uh, yeah, I, I just think so often we're looking for like the quick fixes of things, but it's just yeah. like a small adjustment. And we spoke before about... Um, boundaries and I think a lot of that checklist has to do with like boundaries for yourself as well mm. so like if you're sitting on your phone like I've done this a thousand times I'll own this I'm sitting on my phone I'm scrolling and it's like it's 11 30 and it's like 12 o'clock and I'm like I have not kept this boundary and this commitment to myself yeah. that I'm gonna get off my phone like put your phone down yeah and like go to bed but it's I feel like the sooner you commit to yourself and mm. you actually like live those boundaries that you have for yourself, mm. like if someone texts you at 11 p.m., you don't need to reply. You know, like 100%. that's a boundary. Or Who's texting like, you at 11 a.m., 11 p.m.? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> um, no, so like you can reply tomorrow. You can set that boundary, but I feel like – when I'm slipping on these things, it's when I'm losing the commitment that I have to myself to yeah. upkeep these, to keep me happy and therefore show up for everyone else as the best version of myself. Because yeah. if I'm lacking on a lot of these things, I'm going to show up as a, not a great person. And when, and when you <laughs> set, but when you set those boundaries, you've got evidence for yourself that you show up for yourself. 100%. And then you, that's building confidence yeah commit to you and then you can commit to somebody but, else but that com <laughs> the conversation around confidence like how do i get to become confident it's like we'll build a stack of undeniable evidence that you are who you say you are it's like the layers of paint that build a mountain so like every action you do it's like a little layer of paint and then after a year after two years five years ten years you got this huge mountain and you've got a stack of evidence to say that's exactly who you are and the oh i i love everything about that because i also feel like that's how I show up with other people as well. Mm. And like I know when I'm lacking on a lot of these things is when say with friendships or relationships or whatever, I end up being like, well, you, like what's, you know, are you doing all of these things? Like mm. it's probably because I feel like I'm personally not. So if I can worry about my garden first yeah. Yeah, 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 and like make sure that that's, you know, tidy and I'm sticking to those things, then I'm not going to question so much in other people around what they're doing like yeah. just worry about yourself like you don't have to worry about what everybody else is doing but I've found myself at times when I know I'm lacking on things questioning other people mm. you're so wise Kels oh, <laughs> <that's what. laughs> you're so wise I love these conversations I feel like this is just like one of our normal conversations <laughs> that know, we would I'm, have. Like, <laughs> I'm like this is probably just us also we'll turn the mics off we're gonna have dinner and then it'll just be like Three more hours of chatting. We're gonna, we're gonna no, go I have places three, to be. We're going to have two or three teas before before we get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when we had dinner at Future Future the other night. It was just like this conversation. Yes. And that's why, the, that's why I love like these friendships so much because you can actually go deep and you can actually get a really great understanding with people and lean on like lean on people who are in your close network. Well, I would call you if I was in trouble. So really? Just so you know. That's, I think, the best compliment anyone's ever given me. There you go. That's, I think that's when you know you're on the right track. Yeah. Um, Keep I've, it up. Thank you. Don't fall and, off. But hey, <laughs> but hey, but hey, likewise, like yeah. I've, I've confided in you things that I probably haven't told many, many, <laughs> any, anyone really. Like I've got a very small, like don't get me wrong, I'm, I love having these conversations and I will be there. Like if there is anyone out there struggling, <laughs> you 
can call you me. You call if, me. And if you don't have my number, then probably don't call. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe lean on you someone else. You can't call me. You can't call me. But like I, I am more than happy to have a conversation yeah. with anyone. Um, and then I have, and then likewise, but if, I found like when you're vulnerable with people, people are more likely to be vulnerable. They'll, they'll reciprocate it. Yeah. Um, but I'm not being vulnerable to just anyone, you know, like I, I lean, I lean on a very small group of friends, friends and family for that. Like I'm, I don't need to go and tell everyone I talk to my psych. I talk to maybe three or four mates and my mum and dad sometimes. You yeah. I, I mean? seriously, I reckon I have a circle of seven. Yeah, I'm like, perfect. there's my seven. And one of them's a puppy dog. So. Oh my God. Thank <laughs> you. Love that man. Um, I've got a question. Mm-hmm. If your, if your life was a book, mm-hmm. what chapter do you think changed the direction of your <gasps> life? And what would you call that chapter? <gasps> Great question. Uh, there's a couple. One I really don't want to touch on, and that's I'm fine. just going to leave that okay, <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, that changed sort of like my view on just my self, my identity, and my self worth, and like who I am. And then the it's weird because I don't I don't like saying it that it was this moment in time, mm. but it's when I did my ACL, and I feel like it was the it was a chapter that changed everything because everything was so wrong before that. So mm. I had prioritized the wrong things, which was, you know, netball was my life and like this is all I am and I was like I am netball and everything. So mm. I feel like my ACL was this kind – I look at it as like a <laughs> – the universe, not that I really believe in that, yeah. but like was sending me a bit of a message to be like dull, like you need to – experience life without this netball yeah. to figure out because like there's not much substance underneath you identifying as netball really? and like that's pretty harsh to myself but yeah there wasn't much to me outside of what I had envisioned for myself with netball um, and I feel like it just allowed me to sort of get the beliefs around I am multifaceted there's so much more to me than this and if this was taken away from me tomorrow would I be okay and mm. sort of sent me on the journey of um you know, who am I as a person without this thing that I've almost attached to in a really unhealthy way. Yeah. Um, and the other, there's, yeah, there's probably like three moments. That's what one. would you call that it's, chapter? Oh, it's, what would I call it? The ACL, um, the ACL chapter. Um, bro, oh gosh. I don't know. That's hard. Um, oh, we'll move on. Yeah, okay. I'll come back to that. Come back. The next one would be this year. Really? Um with there was something that changed in my life with a family member that like I just never thought would happen to us. And I have just since been like really nothing else is important. Like honestly, it was like perspective instantly. Like nothing else is important other than this person knowing how much I love them and like um nothing else matters and kind of going back to what my mum had said about the worst thing in life is if I was like genuinely faced with like the mm. worst thing in life is death mm. and anything else we can get through and that was sort of like okay so perspective yeah do, do and want, that chapter would be uh yeah perspective do you, that, want, to, do you want to talk about that chapter or you want to leave that one um oh it's just I probably won't like go into the details but it's um, like I'm so tight with my family. Yeah. They're like the most important people in my life. Sometimes I struggle to show them. I actually find it harder to show my family love than I do like other people, which yeah. I think is Why a weird is phenomenon. That's yeah, weird. it's a weird – like you would probably know how I feel about you more than my family would know how I feel about them. Really? Which is so wild. It's something I'm working on. <laughs> Yeah, no, but, you're like, let's unpack this. <laughs> no, no, because no, I was going to say we we had the conversation the other day about how um, – I don't know how we got into the conversation, but we'll talk about love languages. <laughs> <laughs> Keegan, we're standing there with – like everyone's going to think that <laughs> – Guys, no, um, we went and had ice cream and uh, we're like eating the ice cream and Keegan was like, what do you think your love languages are? No, and it was, and we, because we both landed on um, words of affirmation. Yes. And praise and how we both think that probably like when we were kids, we obviously loved the praise from parents, from coaches, like positive affirmation from 
from people that we care about, right? And I, I take that into everyday life now. Like it feels like sometimes you're almost like looking for praise. Like you, and it's, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds bad Anyone actually. Now I say, no, no, now that I say that out loud, it sounds actually kind of messed up. But you know what I mean? Like it feels good. Like, and, and that's probably why you work so hard. Like you work so hard because you're like, oh, I'm just like, I just need to be good at something. You know what I mean? And then it ties back into the conversation around like your family and like your, imagine your mum and dad would have like, you would have been fighting for like words of affirmation from that. That was honestly like my whole childhood was like, if they told me I was good at something because they were also like never liars. Like if I was bad, they would tell me like yeah. if I was good I, and the kick I got out of my parents being proud of me, oh. weird. <laughs> I look at it now, I'm like weird. Yeah. Um, But it's just, yeah, I just really wanted them to be proud of me and I wanted them to tell me that, you know, everything was great. Mm. Um, they, if I went through this life, this sounds really bad, but like if I went through this life with no one other than my family, I would still be fine. Yeah. Like I love them so much. And um, they, yeah. So there was, you know, a f- like immediate family member is sick at the moment mm. going through a tough time. And um yeah, we were just sort of faced with a moment. Like it's so funny because when it sort of all happened, my sister is like such a strong um, this is what we're going to do. Like she kind of takes the lead mm. and she just went into full blown like are you okay? Is everybody else okay? How's everyone going? I'm all good. Like let's sort mm. it. Like and everyone's sort of characters came out. I was a mess. Like I was like yeah. ah, like crying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah it's been probably a thing for me and I don't want to use this as like oh it's been a growth moment for me um because it's so much more than that but Mm -hmm. it I have reflected on like what is important to me and um yeah so I, I think it's just been a perspective piece and something that I never thought that I would have to handle mm. and I reckon my circle has gotten really small because the ones who know about it and the ones who are constantly checking on me and asking about it yeah. are the ones that I've kept close. And yeah. um yeah, it's just it's just stuff that you have to go through and it's mm. it's life. Um, but I do think those things can be massive perspective. And shout out like to the person who I'm talking about. You are just the most incredible person I know because mm. I know they'll they, be listening. They'll know. They'll yeah, they'll know. know. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, Kels, what are you what are you looking forward to? What, what's coming up? What's like? What, I know we, we touched on a lot of topics um, today. Um, what are some things that you're looking forward to that's coming up? Um, for me, I'm just really loving the commentary stuff. For me, it's like. I've stepped into this new realm where I'm a beginner and a learner and a sponge again. And um, not that I wasn't that, like I feel like you're always learning throughout your career as a netball or a sports person. Like there's Mm. always things that you can improve on. But when you've been in the landscape for nine years, it's no longer like you're no longer new. Yeah. Um, And everyone sort of knows like the ins and outs of you. But I'm sort of, I'm in a new environment. It's new people. I'm... um, learning like different skills and it just feels like this whole fr- I feel like a beginner again yeah. like um um a real student um so that's really exciting for me uh I think I don't have a lot of holidays coming up mm. um but I'm really enjoying my relationship with how much I'm enjoying work and that's not like a toxic thing like I'm a workaholic or anything like that yeah. but I'm getting so much enjoyment out of work it doesn't feel like work at the moment so yeah. I'm working a lot. Kels, before before we wrap things up, is there anything else that you'd like to touch on today? I know we touched on quite a few things. I feel like we could have gone forever, but our batteries are dying. <laughs> um, is there Probably for a good thing. Is there anything else you'd like to touch on before we wrap it up? No, I just think the discussions around these things um, are, st- are just so important. I think, yeah, I think what you're doing is awesome. And I think anyone who's in this space and, and feels comfortable enough to talk about it, yeah, it can feel scary at times, but it's also helping more people than you know. Um, I still listen to podcasts of like other people talking about um, and their mental health or or just their experiences in life. I think the biggest thing, my biggest advice to anyone, if you mm. want to listen or not, mm. is just like talk to people, meet people, 
take things on of other people. A lot of what I live by in my life are things that I've learned through people that I've met in my life, some who are still around, some who ha- have played fleeting roles in my life. But mm. I can, you can always take and learn things from new people and I think that's the best philosophy to have in life. Kels, you're the best. <laughs> thank you, hey, no, thank you so much for jumping on. I, this was this was a conversation that, like I said before, I was um, probably most excited <laughs> to have purely just from our relationship and our friendship over, over the last 14 months. Um, but, <laughs> but no, I, I am super proud of everything that you're doing in this space. Um, I can't wait to see what the next couple of years look like for you because I feel like whatever you do, you put 150% into. And so I think you're going to have success in whatever it's going to be. Whether And and it might be the commentary. It might be something else. It might be something totally left field. So, so proud of you. Got a lot of love for you. Um, thanks again for jumping on. Thanks, Keeks. You're the, you're the best. best.